Hello and welcome to another KSP On Live Saturdays event. I am Nad Bastero, a KSP volunteer, a wife and a mom to three wonderful kids. We are now at session two of Crucible and we'll be focusing on faith versus fear from the story of David and Goliath. Last week we learned that the crucible is a ceramic or metal receptacle where various substances like gold are melted to refinement under intense heat. It is said that we as Christians face various crucible moments as well during our time on earth to refine us. These are experiences that refine our inner self to separate the impurities within, to draw out the most beautiful character that God is creating in us. Wasn't it Jesus who said in John 16, 33, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Many have counted the phrase, fear not or be not afraid, appearing 365 times in the Bible, one for each day of the year. Is that a coincidence? I believe it's intentional. In the story, God draws an awesome contrast on real strength and worldly strength. David faced Goliath at just the right moment at the Valley of Elah. For 40 days, Goliath, the nine-some-foot-tall Philistine battle champion, full-clad in his impressive armor, taunted the Israelite army to send him someone to face off with, throwing a condition with careless assurance that if the single Israelite prevail over him, the Philistines will be Israel's slave henceforth. The Philistines viewed Goliath's massive structure, armaments, past victories, and fierceness in battle as a sure anchor of strength, and that he will not be defeated. Saul, on the other hand, king of the Israelites, cowered in fear with what he saw. He believed that Goliath's perceivable strength had something to boast. The battle was already lost in Saul's mind. Instead of looking to God who put him on the throne and empowering his army to do the same, he instead looked at himself, his resources, the weakness of his army, and was convinced there was no winning it. He believed with physical eyes in what the enemy showed him and defiantly kept shut his spiritual eyes to what God wanted him to see. In comes the shepherd boy David, who came just to deliver rations for his brothers in the front lines. He heard Goliath's taunting, and a search of zealousness for God moved him to volunteer to defeat the giant who dared to come against the army of God. Now whether David was fully aware of what he was talking about or not, we can still see how the Spirit of God moved him to speak and act towards God's purpose. God's preparation versus worldly preparation. Saul clothed David in his own battle gear, preparing him in Saul's way. David was weighed down by Saul's armor and opted to remove them. He believed and understood with conviction in his heart that the Spirit of God who empowered him to defeat bears and lions with his bare hands can empower him again to defeat the heathen champion. He'd rather don the full armor of God. In modern times, we prepare ourselves with education or material things geared on climbing up the ranks. With hefty bank accounts and securing higher positions in society, thinking that these things are what will secure our place in the world to help us defeat the so-called Goliaths we hardly even recognize. God prepares us differently. In David's example, God prepared him through, number one, through daily encounters and challenges. David made the most of his daily travails. He encountered bears and lions when he shepherded the family flock. Through these long, arduous days, God developed physical, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual strength in David that helped him progress from failures to victories. He became so strong in spirit and conviction that he was able to kill with his bare hands animals that were physically stronger than him, which were miracles in and of itself. Was it because his muscles were larger? Perhaps he was muscular, yes. But I believe it was coupled with his intellect, conviction, and awareness that helped him outsmart the opponent. 
He honed his skill in maiming targets with simple weapons, a staff, a rod, a sling, a knife. Most importantly, David developed an understanding of who really is the strength giver. He did not just rely on his physique and knowledge, though they were instrumental. He relied on God, work in and through him above all. He knew that God was the one who saved him. Number two, through worship and stillness. There are five books in the book of Psalms, and David is one of its major contributors. The book of Psalms records many of David's worship to God. They were his means of communing with God, ministering to God. They were his prayers. He continued to remember God. He acknowledged God. In solitude, he played his harp in worship, even while tending to sheep in the wilderness, where he opened his soul and spirit to God. If you read the book of Samuel, it is mentioned that David even played the harp to soothe Saul's deluded mind. We also learn from Gideon's story in the story of the fall of Jericho how worship is a weapon in spiritual warfare. Alone in the wilderness, God taught David how to wield the weapon of worship. Number three, through suffering and humility. David was an unfavored brother among eight. He was a youngest and therefore most neglected. During that time, it was a common thing among families. His family didn't think much of him and was only regarded for menial tasks. He was always behind his older brothers who served in the army of Saul. And he was almost like a slave to them, bringing them what they need, clothing them, running errands for them, then shuffling back and forth to tend to his father's sheep. Shepherding was even the lowliest occupation at that time. No one would have guessed that God was molding in him a humble spirit that responded to God's spirit. David's humble spirit was how God was able to use him effectively. Number four, through right perspective, boldness, and zeal. David's older brother Eliab was angry at David for speaking with the other soldiers about the uncircumcised Philistine who defied their army. He was trying to make him shut up about his convictions, about speaking against the strong threat. But David did not allow his boldness and zeal for the living God he knew to be quelled. He did not accept the shame that was being thrown by the Philistine to God's chosen people. Compromise was not an option. He committed to fight and defeat Goliath without flinching because he already had an encounter with the real champion, which is God. My Goliath came early in life in the form of depression, and it taunted me for more than a decade, more than 10 years, imagine. I was riddled with fear and illness in my youth because of my state of mind. I kept getting sick. This was for reasons I will not share now, but I had no self-worth to speak of, and to top it off, I agreed to hate myself. If you can't beat them, join them, Ikanga. I agreed with the negative voices in my head. Part of my defense was to forget memories. It later progressed to forgetting people's names and places, forgetting school schedules or requirements. I forgot how many times I have taken my meds even, or if I have eaten that day. I even forgot my own birthdays at times. True, I got sick from my head to my toes, from the inside out. No exaggeration. I was almost sure I won't graduate college. At some point as a teen, I started reading the Bible. I largely did not understand what I read, but in times when I was most tormented, God enabled me to remember passages like Romans 8 1 there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus Romans 12 2 be transformed by the renewing of your mind Job 13 5 though he slay me yet will I trust him and even 1 Thessalonians 5 18 in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you Psalm 89 verse 26, He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress, I will never be shaken. 1 Peter 5.8, Be sober-minded, be watchful. 
your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour and most especially Isaiah 53 4 surely he took on our infirmities and carried our sorrows yet we considered him stricken by God struck down and afflicted but he was pierced for our transgressions he was crushed for our iniquities the punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed I didn't know it then but God had been constantly speaking to me I would even have the urge to walk when I felt the need to run from my thoughts he made me healthy that way God spoke to me through nature my love for growing things and animals, how I observed them and read about them, made me very happy. He gave me abilities that allowed me to de-stress, like drawing or painting, singing, praise, and even writing where I poured my negative energy into. At some point in my 20s, God made me bold enough to speak life into my hands where my skin and nails were coming off due to allergy. He was molding me from the inside out. He opened my mouth to speak with zeal, even when I didn't have the courage. He allowed me to share the gospel to others, even in brokenness. He didn't spare me from the fire of the crucible, but helped me endure through it, so I could become a better version of myself. I came out of darkness, able to stand, than when I first crawled in. I then understood that my enemy had no bearing against the living God. There is power in the name of our God. There is power and authority in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And His Word, the Bible, is life and light to our entire being. Another crucible phase was when we almost lost our firstborn to dengue. And then fast forward years later, when I was eight months pregnant with my youngest, I was then out of corporate and already working from home. On the same day, both my husband's client and mine pulled the plug on us. We had two other children to take care of in an upcoming hospital expense during the Christmas season. Coincidence? Far from it. That was the year he taught me how to free fall in his spirit and truly come under his wing. Surrendering to his power and will became the most liberating and empowering experience I've ever had. He made me rest in Him. He took care of everything He provided. Through it all, God showed His might and His faithfulness that never fails. His thoughts are not our thoughts, neither are our ways His ways. He is able, even now, in any and every circumstance, to show the greatness of His love and faithfulness. Remember that whatever God allows, He also redeems. The God who knows the number of hairs on our head also hears the groaning of our hearts. He knows our comings and goings. He is in control over the number of our days. It is up to us to rally beside Him or against Him, to use our days for His glory or not. But it is my avowed prayer that none of us will fall away from faith as we face the fire of our crucibles. Now, was David successful? God's hand, I believe, was behind Goliath's head that made the pebble David slung get buried into his forehead. The giant threat died and fell face down. David separated Goliath's head from his shoulder with his own giant sword and presented God's victory to Saul. What a glorious ending, don't you think? And what a terrible rebuke to Saul. Zechariah 4 6 tells us, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. From getting anointed to becoming king, David was around 12 years old when Samuel anointed him. He became king at 30. In between, God allowed him to face crucibles of various kinds to prepare him for his purpose and eternity. I hope this story and its lessons blessed you as it did me. Do stick around to go through the discussion questions in group. It will be flashed shortly on your screens. Till next time, God bless you.